ladies and gentlemen, and now to present our next award, the Tax Prof. Yes! Yes! Thank you! Thank you! Yes! Yeah! That's right, get excited for tax! Yeah! Woo! Raise it up! Raise it up! Come on now, get more excited! Yeah! You won this award, right? Get excited for tax! All right now, all right, all right. So this next award and video covers the top 40 tax doctrines. This one is extremely important because it, it's a package award. It takes into account not only code sections, cases, areas of tax law, it puts it all together, all those things together, all these elements into an award. Of all the different awards, I would say this one is the most comprehensive. All right, let's go ahead, let's jump into it and get to these top tax doctrines. So this is the top 40 tax doctrines. And when we're looking at the top 40 tax doctrines, it's important to make sure that you look at the top tax cases. I have a video on that topic. Um, top 50 tax cases, also top 100 code sections. Look at those first because a lot of stuff that's referenced in the top 40 tax doctrines focuses on um, those elements. You're going to see that some of the top 50 cases are actually a doctrine because they rise to the level they apply generally. For example, we're going to see early on Aerosmith doctrine is from the Aerosmith case, and that was something we talked about in the top 50 tax cases. So just keep that in mind. Um, you probably want to go through this after you've gone through the top code sections, top cases. So the first one is the acceleration of income doctrine. So one thing to note about this is the PG Lake decision, U.S. Supreme Court decision. And if you recall that case, what that dealt with, or the general principle from that case deals with, is let's say that you are selling a business and part of the business deals with contracts that are ongoing and the buyer of the business is going to acquire these ongoing contracts going forward. So the question is, well, what kind of, what's the characterization of those contracts going forward and the value of those contracts to the seller that's getting out of those, those contracts now and selling them to the buyer? Well, PG Lake, basically what it does is it carves out the income component of property and it dealt with mineral royalty rights in the actual PG Lake case and sells it separate from the property that has ordinary income in the year of sale with no basis recovery. So the idea in our example with the contracts, like let's say you're an accounting business and you're selling your accounting business, right? You've got all different types of assets. You've got accounts receivable, you've got buildings, you've got equipment, you've got uh, fax machines, you've got copying machines, and you've also got some contracts that are ongoing that now the buyer is going to step into the shoes of the seller and, and carry those out. Well, to the seller, the character of those contracts, which some people might argue is capital or 1231, is going to be viewed as ordinary because the root of those contracts itself, if they were performed by the seller and they weren't actually sold would have been ordinary income anyways. So it carves out th that aspect of the sale of the assets and it says, hey, you would have recorded ordinary income from performing those services anyways. So that part of the sale of the business will be viewed as ordinary income in itself, even though you might be able to argue, hey, it's an intangible like goodwill, okay, which goodwill um, under the case law has traditionally been given a capital treatment. This doctrine applies to income and not deductions. So that's something important to understand. Now, one thing I want to um, highlight, when we think about the five general tax questions, right, our favorite five tax questions, of the five questions, which question do you think this addresses? Well, of course, it's going to be the central question is going to be character. What is the character? And some of these doctrines we're going to see um, address multiple questions, so it's kind of hard to group what the central question is. But this one, the central question deals with characterization. It's not, oh, when do we have income or do we have income at all? It's no, we're selling a business. And again, part of that is a contractual um, arrangement that the buyer is going to step into the shoes and perform the accounting services. What's the characterization of, of that element? So character 
is really the, the central aspect. Okay, so again, this focuses on income, not deductions. Hence, the sale of the non-income component and retention of the income component will not result in a deductible loss. Also, taxpayers who seek to take advantage of the acceleration of income doctrine may be restricted by the substance of reform doctrine. The transaction may be characterized as a loan secured by a future income stream. So, <clears throat> the reason why it's also called the acceleration of income doctrine which makes it kind of confusing. It seems like it sounds like a when question, and it's, again, it's more of a character question. Is because the idea is that if you're selling these contract rights that you would have performed over time, you have to record ordinary income up front. But again, it's ordinary income is the key, is what it is. That's what this carves out is this ordinary income aspect of it. So don't get confused by the title. This is one of the doctrines where people get confused. Hey, it's acceleration of income. Therefore, it's definitely going to be a uh, a when question. No, it's going to be a characterization question. All right. The second one is the accounting method definition. So this, of course, is going to be the when question. Anytime we do have the accounting method, right, cash versus accrual method versus hybrid, we're talking about accounting method. What is the accounting method of the taxpayer? Is it cash method taxpayer, accrual method taxpayer? And just recall that um, when you think about accounting methods, Cash method, in general, we record income when cash is received. We record expenses when cash is paid. Accrual, we record income when it's earned. We record expenses when they're incurred. So just keep that in mind. So the accounting method definition, if a taxpayer treats an item or a type of income erroneously in multiple tax years, this behavior amounts to an accounting method, albeit an erroneous one. So it's a special consideration where if you've messed up in a previous year, it actually allows you to basically treat the transactions that you messed up on as its own accounting method for purpose of that transaction. As a result, the taxpayer may not change to a proper method of accounting without satisfying the appropriate procedures for doing so, which include the application of Section 481, which the late 400 sections are the one question. There's a rev, I'm sorry, rev proc that deals with this. Um, and... There's also the uh, Diebold case. Uh, a taxpayer may not, without the commissioner's consent, retroactively change from an erroneous to a permissible method of accounting by filing an amended return. The application of this accounting method definition remains controversial. When applied, it's a powerful tool for the government. So this is something from the angle of the government they can use to basically go against taxpayers. But the key is that it does deal with situations of erroneously reporting and how that's going to be recorded uh, going forward as well as the previous years of uh, amendments or whatnot are needed. All right, Aerosmith. So the Aerosmith doctrine is going to be a characterization question, character of the five questions. Now, the Aerosmith doctrine comes from the Aerosmith versus Commissioner Supreme Court decision. And this deals with the character of a transaction. It's a function of the transaction as a whole, even if it happens in multiple years, which the Aerosmith line of cases deals with the um, North American oil, U.S. versus Lewis. There's a whole line of cases that deal with this uh, transactional multiple year issue. But the key with Aerosmith is that we're looking at the um, respective if we have a transaction that happens in um, in one year, like let's say, perfect example of this is Section 1245 depreciation recapture. When you take depreciation, you get ordinary deduction benefits. When you later sell that property, it might result in Section 1231, for example, because you're a business activity. You've held it for more than a year, get Section 1231 gain, which could result in long-term capital gain. Well, the matching... The matching of getting an ordinary tax benefit with potential capital gain, right? Long-term capital gain, that does not match because long-term capital gains have different rates than ordinary gains. So what Section 1245, which Section 1245 is basically a, an example of the Aerosmith Doctrine where it's been applied. What it does is it says, okay, well, you got the benefit of ordinary deductions. Now when you sell it, yeah, you might get 1231 gains, which could result in long-term capital, but we're actually going to make you have to recoup it as ordinary to match the character. 
So it is an idea of matching in a sense, matching of characterization. All right, the next one, assignment of income doctrine. So this is a huge aspect of the tax law. And of course, the question it deals with of the five questions is the who question. Who has to record income? Who gets deduction? Who gets credit? Who gets to utilize the credit, I should say? So the assignment of income doctrine, there's a whole line of case law that focuses on the who question, right? Who has income? Who has deduction? Lucas v. Earl and Helvering v. Horse are the two main ones. There's other ones out there. There's the Eubank decision. There's um, the Giannini case, which is a well-known um, uh, case when it comes to the who question. There's lots of, um, of, of uh, assignment of income cases. So the assignment of income doctrine broadly states that income from services are taxed the, the one who performs the services and income from property is taxed to the owner of property. So Lucas V. Earl set the um, services, Helvering V. Horse set the property aspect of that. And the idea here in Helvering, I'm sorry, in Lucas V. Earl, you know, husband and wife, husband basically wanted to split everything 50-50 and they weren't in community property. Um, to, you know, you might be thinking, what about community property? Yes, that is an exception to this where you can split it even though one spouse earns all the money but where everything's 50-50. But that was not an issue here. Community property was not an, a valid issue in this case. So in Lucas v. Earl, husband and wife, husband did all the work and performed all the services for the family and made had, a, had the salary. Wife had no salary, but they wanted to split it between the two taxpayers to take advantage of tax rates. Guess what? Couldn't do it. Husband was taxed on 100% of it. Helvering v. Horse, in that case, a father owns a bond father gifts the um, coupons to the son and then the father says well son you're getting the income from the bonds you report them of course son was in a lower tax bracket so that was what they tried to do well helping v. horse court said he or she or it that owns the property here the bonds is also taxed on the coupons the fruit and tree of fruit and tree doctrine we call it right he or she that owns the tree is taxable on the fruit as well Okay, next one. Burgess versus Battlestein scenario. So this one's not as common, but very important. A taxpayer may not pay an amount of funds borrowed from the creditor immediately prior to the attempted payment. So this was a Fifth Circuit decision. A taxpayer, however, may borrow funds from a third party and then effectuate a payment using those funds. Economically, the two transactions are identical. Legally, however, they are different. Under the Burgess decision, a taxpayer may borrow from a creditor, commingle the funds with other funds, wait some period of time, and then successfully pay the creditor lender. So this is not a doctrine where you can lump it with one of the five, um, five general questions. It, it addresses many issues. The one thing I will say about this is there's something in the tax law called the step transaction doctrine, where Congress, I'm sorry, not Congress, the IRS will put together different transactions to basically say, hey, you did these transactions in part because you were trying to get around the tax law some way. So this ba uh, Burgess Bowsey scenario is, is an example of the step transaction doctrine in a way because basically a taxpayer may not pay an amount of funds borrowed from the creditor immediately prior to the attempt of payment. So think about the two transactions. You got the borrowing and the payment of that. They're putting it together. They're collapsing the step transaction into one transaction. You did it in steps to try to get around the tax law a certain way, but IRS says, no, you just did this to circumvent the tax law. However, the step transaction, this burgess Ballstein scenario, will not apply, however, if you do it from a third party and then effectuate payment. So this is just one example of a step transaction doctrine. Business purpose. So business purpose is another example of an area where it's not a specific tax question, but it applies overall. And there's a line of doctrines we're going to talk about, business purpose, sham transaction, uh, substance over form, form over substance, that kind of deal with kind of like the idea of the step transaction where people are trying to basically avoid tax without, with no economics, no economic reality. Okay? And this is throughout the entire tax law, partnership tax law, substantial economic effect, whether you can actually allocate, you know, losses and income to one partner over another. This is 
in so many different areas of the tax law, corporate tax law, whether you're doing something, creating a corporation, um, you know, forming it in certain ways, um, whether it, you look at the business purpose doctrine and other and some of these other doctrines I mentioned. So business purpose doctrine, if a transaction has no substantial business purpose, so again, the economics, there's no economics there, other than tax avoidance or reduction of income tax, the law will not respect the transaction. This doctrine arose from Gre Gregory v. Helvering, famous case, um, Justice Cardozo, life in all of its fullness, addresses the answer to the rid riddle, which also addressed the substance over form doctrine that we're going to mention as well. So when you're keeping track of these doctrines, some of them, again, are tied together, and business purpose is tied with substance over form. Now, the issue here is, again, you're looking at, there's no economics. You created a business or you did some type of business transaction purely to avoid tax. Well, there's also famous case law, uh, Justice Learned Hand, where Justice Learned Hand said um, in one of, the, one of the Supreme Court cases that taxpayers are able to arrange their transactions, their affairs, in any way they see fit, even if it avoids tax law. So you got this, basically, this... Um, uh, bumping up against one concept over another. You got all these business purpose, economic substance, substance over form, sham transaction doctrines, bumping up against, okay, well, in the Supreme Court, and it hasn't been overruled yet, where, hey, Justice Learned Hand said a taxpayer can arrange his or her affairs, whatever it deems fit, even if it avoids taxes. Okay, so you got to think about those things. The key here, though, is if you're creating a business solely just for tax reasons, you got to be very mindful because the IRS might argue business purpose doctrine or sham transaction, substance over form, one of those things. All right, the cash equivalence doctrine. So cash equivalence doctrine, an unsecured promise to pay of a solvent obliger, readily transferable, not subject to set off, and not subject to a discount substantially greater than the prevailing market rate is the equivalent of cash. So the cash equivalence doctrine really deals with the, I mean, it deals with multiple questions of the five questions. I mean, it deals with whether you have income. It deals with when. I would say the main area we see is the whether you have income question. Because if you're receiving a, a something of value that has very similar um, cash equivalents, well, the question might rise, okay, well, what is the value of the item for purposes of what you receive for tax? Well, again, cash equivalents, just like in accounting, certain things have cash equivalents and reported like cash, similar idea. So Cowden versus Commissioner is a case. As such, the fair market value of the promise is includable in income upon receipt by cash method uh, taxpayer. So that's where it comes into the when question. So the income question, the when question, right? Well, cash method taxpayer records income when cash is received. So that's where it becomes a when question is when, um, the, if something like a note, an unsecured promise to pay, a note is received, but it's so readily available the, 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 um, where it rises to a certain level where it might be considered cash equivalents. Yes, a note is considered property versus cash. Well, cash equivalents, it might rise to the level of cash and it has to be recorded when, you know, for the services or whatever it is, when the actual note is received based on the cash equivalents doctrine. All right, the next one, judicial deference to the executive branch. So there have been many cases over the years that have dealt with deference and deference. This is not a question of, oh, of the five questions. This has to do with when can courts, I'm sorry, my apologies, when can regulations, so it is determined by the courts and it, because the, the courts are set with interpreting tax law, right? When can courts or when can tax law, when can regulations by the IRS and Treasury rise to the level of primary authority? Now, regulations, as we know, there's um, legislative, there's um, procedural, and there's other types, general um, regulations, okay? If you have a legislative regulation, that means that Congress has specifically noted out that, hey, we're going to defer to 
to Treasury and IRS on this respective issue to write rules. But let's say it's just a general uh, regulation where Congress has not laid that out. The question by the courts is, hey, can the executive branch in this specific topic, are they allowed to basically write tax law? Because Constitution says that for the most part, Congress is the one that levies taxes and deals with the tax law. So that's kind of the issue with deference. Judicial deference to the executive branch. Will we give the executive branch deference with respect to this issue, this area of law? Commerciality doctrine is another um, area where there's not one specific of the five questions. This deals with tax-exempt orgs. Organizations which are overly commercial are not entitled to exempt status under Section 501c3 and its predecessors. This is from the Better Business Bureau case, um, which is one of the uh, cases that I've mentioned before. All right, claim of right doctrine. So this, of course, is going to be a when question. A when question. When a taxpayer receives funds, which represent earnings, with a contingent obligation to repay them, either because the sum is disputed or mistakenly paid, and no limitation on the use of funds exists, the taxpayer must include those funds in income in the year they are received. So this is, ba this is from the North American Oil case. North American Oil Consolidated versus Burnett. This rule applies to a cash method taxpayer. Whether it also applies to accrual method taxpayers is um, an issue under the Schlutte Doctrine, which is another one of the doctrines. So what's going on here, taxpayer receives um, some funds, whether it's a bonus. Let's say you receive a bonus from doing a good job during the year, but the bonus is contingent on you staying at your business for a whole more one more whole year. Okay? So you get the bonus. When you get it, you record an income because you're cash method when you receive the money for services you perform. Right? It's a bonus. You've, it's based off uh, past performance. Okay, so you record, let's say it's a $40,000 bonus. You record $40,000 of income when you receive it because you get a $40,000 check. You're going to have to repay $40,000 if, based on the contractual language, if you leave that employer in the next year. So let's say you leave next October. You've got to pay $40,000 back. So the question is, do you amend your return from previous year? What do you do? So you included it in year one when you received the $40,000 bonus, but then year two you get a deduction for the amount. Now it's not a perfect situation. And the reason why is because, well, tax rates might have changed, right? If you're between two changes of tax rates, where one year, or you might be in different tax brackets and depending on your income levels those years. So it might actually give you more or less benefit depending on the situation. It's not a perfect situation how we do it, but that's how we do it because the idea of the close of the tax year principle, right? Under the um, Aerosmith Doctrine, under U.S. v. Lewis, uh, Stanford and Brooks, right? All those cases. And also, Claim of Right Doctrine, North American Oil is part of that line as well, the close of the tax year principle. Okay, the Cohan Rule. So this one deals with being able to substantiate expenses. So Mr. Cohan was a famous entertainer back in the uh, 20s. And the idea here was it was widely, ex uh, widely accepted that in some industries, certain types of professionals or people, or workers, would have to spend money, okay, traveling, traveling from city to city, or meals. And that's exactly what happened with Cohan. He was um, an entertainer, traveling from city to city, doing shows, whatever, paying for meals, paying for lodging. Now, as many of you already know, when it comes to deductions, substantiation is an extremely poor, important element, and that's always been the case in the U.S. income tax law. Well, what if you don't have substantiation? Does that mean you're never going to be able to take a deduction? For some things, that is the case. You do need substantiation. So if the IRS comes knocking at the door and they say, hey, you put this on your tax return, we need to see the substantiation, the receipts. And you say, well, I don't have them. Eh, don't get it. Not everything, though. The Cohan rule says, if a taxpayer cannot prove the amount of an expense, the trier of fact may nevertheless estimate. Because, again, the idea is that in some areas, some industries, it's just so widely accepted that you're going to be traveling and doing these things, going to shows, right? And you're going to have to spend. So we can do, provide estimates. Estimates for a reasonable amount. 
if the amount has clearly been expended to allow nothing because of inadequate documentation, that's unreasonable. And that's what the Cohen rule said. Now, there is um, caution because certain areas of tax law, so if something under Section 274D says, if something is listed under Section 274D, you definitely need substantiation. This allows travel and entertainment expenses when no documentation. Also, charitable contributions also need documentation as well. If they're over a certain amount, generally they need to be substantiated, but over a certain amount, you'll definitely get disallowed. So this is very much limited. And yes, I know at the time of the video that entertainment expenses are no longer allowed, but hey, in the future, who knows, maybe the tax law could change and they're allowed again. All right. So the Cohan rule deals with deductions, whether you can actually deduct. Right? Remember the five questions? Whether you can deduct. Constructive receipt doctrine. A cash with the taxpayer has income when, hey, look at that. That's the when question. When the proceeds are available to him without substantial limitations and he refuses or neglects to accept them. So this doctrine arrives from the 400s, 451, also Cowden case. Um, basically, the idea here is if you got a cash benefit taxpayer, right, also found in the Martin case, let's say that you got a client, you do some work in your cash method, you do painting business, and you receive or you do services. You complete the service at the end of the year, client comes to your door December 20th, seventh of the year and says, hey, I want to give you a check. And you're like, no, no, no. Give me the check after the holidays. Bring it back after, bring it back January 3rd after the holidays because I don't want to deposit until the holidays. I don't have to worry about it. So they leave. And then you get it on January 3rd. So the question is your cash method. Should you include it in year two, January 3rd, or year one? Well, it's year one because you could have accepted it. So if you actually can take from, you know, the cash, the check here, but you just foregone it, you know, you could have, it's going to be income in the year you could have received it. The exceptions to this are issues like escrow. Like what if funds are put into escrow and they're not received until year two? So what if the um, you do painting services, the uh, customer puts the funds into escrow and you can't collect them in a year two? That'd be different because then the idea there is you strings attached to it. You can't get it until year two. So that's a different story, right? That's a different story. So corn products doctrine is going to be characterization, a characterization question. And corn products, like many of the other doctrines, comes from an actual case called corn products refining versus commissioner, also a element of the Arkansas best. So what this case deals with is the Section 1221A capital asset list. It basically says that the list of non-capital assets is illustrative rather than exclusive. So those aren't the only ones. It's just illustrative of the types, which is kind of hard because it says 1221A says, hey, all, all assets are capital unless they're one of these things. So it makes it very challenging, but tax law is challenging. So this doctrine was effectively eliminated by Arkansas Best, pursuant to which corn products doctrine applies only to hedging. It basically, Arkansas Best limited the corn products doctrine only to hedging transactions. All right, the next one, court holding company doctrine. So this is an assignment of income doctrine, which we've seen before, right? The tr so it's a who question. Who? So under the assignment of income doctrine, the transferee completion of a transaction negotiated and fully arranged by a transferor may be uh, attributed to the transferor along with the imputed transfer of the proceeds. So this is just a... Um, continuation of the assignment of income doctrine. It's also where the substance over form doctrine and the assignment of income doctrine, they kind of collide. Two doctrines coming together, creating a new doctrine, court holding. All right, the Crane Rule. So Crane and Tufts, they go together. The Crane Rule basically just, this deals with when do we have, I'm sorry, um, this one deals with two central issues. I would say the main one is, do we have income? But you could also argue it might be considered a when question of the central issues. And what this deals with is liabilities. That's the central element of the Crane Rule. So the Crane Rule, the amount realized from a taxable event, includes the amount of the transfer's debt assumed by the purchaser. It also includes the amount of debt to which the property is subject 
even if the debt is not assumed. So here's the issue. Let's say you own some property, has a mortgage on it, it goes down in value. And the new person is going to take on the property subject to the mortgage, but they don't give you any actual comp compensation, any cash or anything. So it's all just constructive cash. The question is, in calculating any gain, what goes in there? And the answer is, the amount realized includes the amount of the transferor's debt, so the liability relief goes in there. So when you're see, when you're learning about this, you might say, hey, I thought that was just a fundamental concept. Well, at one point, it was not a fundamental concept. It was confused at one point. So the Crane Rule, which is a Supreme Court case, made that official. Now, Tufts answered the question in the uh, famous footnote 37 in the Crane case, what if the, what if the um, liability on the property was non-recourse? Recourse versus non-recourse. Well, Tuff said you still got to include it. You still got to put it in there. Now, I will tell you that whether a liability is recourse versus non-recourse, there is going to be differences in tax consequences in certain situations. It might be the same. It might be different. But the key is that... Under the Crane Rule, which now through Tufts applies to both recourse and non-recourse, you do include the amount of liability relief in your amount realized. And also, as part of that, the basis of the property acquired for with borrowed money includes the amount equal to the borrowed money used. So if you are taking on property, again, it's gone under it's gone under water, right? The value is less than uh, the liability you're taking on. You get to use the liability as your basis when you take on that liability. And that comes from the Parker case. All right, crummy trust doctrine. This one doesn't have any specific questions. It's actually not even an income tax issue. It's more of a gift tax issue. But it is a really important doctrine in tax law. It's actually a gift tax area of uh, doctrines. So I'm just going to read this one to you because it is a very important one. A grantor is allowed a Section 2503B annual exclusion amount for a gift of a future interest. So that's one thing is that the annual exclusion for gifts applies generally to present interests and gifts, not future interests. But if it's a future interest and in a trust to the beneficiary, if the beneficiary is granted a crummy power, and that's what the crummy trust doctrine deals with. That's all I'm going to say about that case. Very, very, very important because before this case, guess what? You couldn't get the annual exclusion amount. At the time of this video, annual exclusion amount, every person gets... Um, Annual exclusion of $15,000 for gift tax purposes. That's going to increase later on the video, I know, or later when you watch this video. could be $16,000 when you watch it, seventeen, so on. $15,000 per donor per year, right? $30,000, 15 dollars 15 If you get to split with spouses, you get to split the two, right, per, per donee per year. So that's powerful. So if, for future interests, if you put in a coming power trust, you can actually use that $15,000, $30,000 for a spouse, $15,000, right? Um that tax planning strategy. All right, Davis Keenan gain. So Davis Keenan gain, this one deals with income. Do we have income? The use of appreciated property to satisfy an obligation or acquire something of value is a taxable event. So if you are using appreciated property to satisfy an obligation, so you trade that in for property for obligation like a note, guess what? You're taxed on the appreciation of the property. So you have to record that income on that property. It's what it's saying. Okay. So if you have some Google stock or some stock in a in a major corporation and you use that to pay off your liability and the property's got and the stock has gone up in value, guess what? You're gonna have income is what it's saying. Destination of income tests. The purpose for which funds are expended is irrelevant to whether the earnings of funds uh, was related to an exempt purpose. This test resulted from congressional happiness with a case called Mueller Company, CF Mueller Company versus Commissioner. Anytime you're dealing with tax exempt, right? It's a tax exempt issue. It doesn't, you can't really categorize it as one of the um, five questions. Because tax exempt organization issues, the 500s, deals with all, all the five questions. Income tax issues, all five. All right, 19. Duty of consistency. Arising from R.H. Stearns, Supreme Court case, the duty is related to estoppel as well as the equitable recruitment, although it applies differently. The court explained that no one shall be permitted um, to found any claim upon his own inequity or take advantage of his wrong. So this duty of consistency, this is actually a procedural um, doctrine. Now, most of you watching the video here in the classroom, 
you're probably not going to deal with procedural issues like this. But issues of estoppel, where you're talking about, you know, trying to bring up claims again, like double jeopardy, those kinds of things, that's what we're dealing with here. Res judicata, those types of things. So this is a procedural issue, so it can't be grouped as one of the five questions. All right, number 20, economic benefit doctrine. A cash method taxpayer has income when, so of course this is going to be a when, when he receives the economic benefit of the proceeds. This occurs even if he lacks actual receipt, constructive receipt, or the receipt of a cash equivalent. So this comes from a famous uh, Sproul versus Commissioner case. Sixth Circuit is uh, one of the first ones we see that. But it goes along with a lot of these other when, like the cash equivalence doctrine, recording of when questions. All right, equitable recruitment. This, again, is another procedural question. So not one of the five questions. Parties timely litigating a tax claim, income or deduction, may recoup a tax bar related claim from the same transaction which resulted in inconsistent treatment. That's the bull case. So the issue here is let's say you have a statute of limitations that comes into play and you're trying to argue a specific and you have a um, trying to argue decision, but it has nothing to do with part of the, that aspect. If you're able to argue and you timely litigate a tax claim, then it might recoup a tax bar related claim from the same transaction, which may be the, um, the statute ran. Because the way that a lot of transactions are categorized is different transactions by the IRS. And they say, hey, well, the statute of limitations, you got it in with for the income issue, but not the deduction issue, that type of consideration. So that's what this equitable recruitment doctrine deals with. Erroneous deduction exception. So recovery of an item erroneously deducted does not result in tax benefit rule, which we're going to talk about tax benefit rule at the end. The tax benefit rule only applies to items previously properly deducted. So if you erroneously um, deducted an item, the tax benefit rule, which is where you get no double tax benefit, that does not necessarily have to apply. Does not. The tax benefit rule applies only to properly deducted items. And there's some cases where this came from, but that's really the idea. So this deals with a deduction issue. Deduction. We could actually take a deduction. Form over substance. So I mentioned earlier, there's a line of doctrines like business purpose, sham transaction, economic substance, form over substance that deal with, again, you got to look at the root of what's going on, the economics. What are the economics of the transaction? Was this done solely for tax avoidance? So form over substance says, this is the corollary of substance over form. Sometimes courts respect form, find that taxpayers are entitled to organize their transactions to reduce taxes. So Gregory versus Helvering is just that. Also important is the use of this rule to prevent a taxpayer from disavowing his own chosen but detrimental formalities. You made your bed, so you lie in it. Um, note the Gregory decision stands for both form over substance and substance over form. So here's the confusion. Substance over form says, hey, you did this transaction, but you did it for tax avoidance purposes, no economic reason. So the substance is that, hey, there's no real substance here. But the form over substance rule says, okay, well, sometimes form controls over substance, so we will give you. So that's why it's very difficult to determine, you know, what's going to happen here with these type of doctrines. So you have to know about both of those because the IRS can come at you with either angle, either side. Obviously, they're going to go for whatever topic is more beneficial to them. Family hostility rule. So this deals with, um, and by the way, the former substance has no none of the five questions. So family hostility, this is a corporate tax issue. When you're looking at distributions, redemptions, all those good things, mainly redemptions. Section 302 redemptions. In many areas of the corporate tax law, you got to take into account attribution of family members, their ownership as well. Well, sometimes... You might, under the tax law, you might say, okay, well, my parent-child, they're viewed to own the stock together. However, if you can prove family hostility, or maybe they don't speak, the, fam the parent and child don't speak, you can actually say, okay, well, we're not going to attribute the stock to the family member. So this one has none of the five questions because it's multiple five of the five questions. It's just a, an exception to areas of the tax law where it's a bright line, hey, you have to attribute stock to other people, okay? Golson rule. So this is another uh, procedural rule. This is where the tax court 
This comes from the Golson case, tax court case. This is where the tax court has to look at the circuit in which the taxpayer resides to see if any of those case, if any cases rule on fa in favor of that. So perfect example, I have another video on splitting circuits with respect to reasonable compensation. If we are in the seventh circuit, the exacto spring circuit, versus if we are in the fifth circuit, well, there is the independent investor test under the seventh circuit exacto case. But then the fifth circuit, we've got a different determination where we focus on distributions and earnings and profits. Well, Depending on where the tax court is hearing the case, it uses the Golson rule to say, hey, we're hearing the case in Dallas, Texas. We're in the Fifth Circuit, so we look at the Fifth Circuit case. We don't look at the Seventh Circuit case. We look at the Fifth Circuit. But if we're in Chicago, Illinois, we have to look at the Seventh Circuit, and then that controlling rule applies. So even though the tax court is a national court, we got to look at the circuit court that applies in that case. Idaho Power. So this is going to be a deduction question deduct and basically just says that depreciation expense and other material costs must be capitalized so it's a capitalization rule it capitalizes costs and you deduct them over time you can also argue it's a when question uh, as well deduction or when because you're still gonna get the benefit through capitalizing it and then deducting integral part doctrine this is an uncodified doctrine that deals with the tax-exempt area. It holds that an entity may achieve tax-exempt status if its activities are integral part of another exempt organization, and they further that exempt organization's purpose by the other organization. Okay, so I'm sure Goodwill, for example, which is a tax-exempt organization we all know about, they have lots of different integral um, uh, entities that are related to them that I guarantee carry on their mission. Legislative grace doctrine. So this one is deals with both income and deductions. It applies to both. The income question, deduction question. And basically it says an income tax deduction is a matter of legislative grace. The burden clearly uh, showing the right of the claim deductions on the taxpayer. It's from interstate transit line. You can also say new colonial ice comes from there as well. And what it says is that for deductions, deductions are matters of legislative grace and should be defined narrowly. Narrowly. But income should be defined broadly. Broadly. And that's what the legislative grace doctrine states. Matching principle. So the matching principle is just in, in accounting. So this is a when question, of course. Matching. When. For generally accepted accounting principles, matching principle requires that income be matched in the same period with the costs that are required to produce it. So income and expenses. Very generally, this rule applies for tax purposes as the accrual method of accounting. However, violation of this rule is common. So there's a few examples like Schluti, where you have to record income early on prepayments. Okay? So no general matching principle of income and deductions or timing or character between taxpayers exists. So it basically says, hey... The matching principle in accounting can be deviated. Gap, generally accepted accounting principles, does not have to be followed for tax. All right, number 30, old and cold doctrine. So this doctrine can apply to any of the five questions. Basically what it says, this is an unstated rule, an idea of the common tax law. Certain areas of tax law where you have requirements and certain relationships. That's, that's how I like, the best way to think about this is relationships. Certain relationships in the tax law, and this applies to just, not just relationships, but other areas of tax law. Certain relationships with tax law get treated a certain way based on how they're characterized a relationship. But let's say that a relationship was, was a certain way one, one time, like an employer-employee, but then in the future, Something happens where they're not employer-employee, and then a transaction happens after that. So the old and cold principle basically says at some point that relationship or those rules go away. They're no longer applicable because that relationship or that idea is gone. So I like to think of this an example is gifts. So if you have an employee-employer and you got a gift, it's almost always going to be not excluded because IRS comes in and says, hey, that's you know, deemed compensation. 
But what happens if you were employee employer, then that, you know, maybe the person retired, and then maybe 10 years later you get a gift? Well, old and cold. They were employee employer 10 years ago, but now you're getting a gift. So that relationship should not be as important because it's old and cold. The idea is it's gone. Old colony, 31. The form of the income does not matter in terms of whether an item is income. So this is an income question. So an old colony, that's the one where the company paid the taxes of the um, employee and it was viewed as, hey, that was considered income to the person. So the form of income doesn't matter. It's still income. Paying taxes even can be considered in income. Open transaction doctrine. So this one is really a when question, but it can be seen as other things as well, but mainly when. A taxpayer need not recognize gain in an open transaction until he recovered his capital. As Burnett v. Logan is the main case there. So at certain installment sales, where installment sales, you know, you're getting payments over time, general rule is you do the gross profit ratio. Well, certain times you're actually able to recover all of your basis up front, open transaction, before you actually have to record that percentage of gain until it gets fully recovered. So open transaction doctrine is when when can you recover the basis? Rabbi trust doctrine, this is a special one, it actually comes from a letter rule. Look at this. A transfer of funds for the benefit of a taxpayer which remains subject to claims of the transfer's creditors does not trigger economic benefit doctrine, which we talked about before. The doctrine arose because it was in, involved a synagogue and a rabbi. Okay? So that is a uh, income question. Income. Realization event doctrine. Mere appreciation and value of asset will not generally result in income. Instead, some realization event such as sale or exchange is typically necessary. You could have involuntary conversions as well. And there was a few cases we talked about in the top 50 cases like Glenshaw Glass. We talked about uh, cottage savings. Those are the, the main ones. That's an income question there as well. Res judicata is a procedural question. And res judicata every year constitutes a separate cause of action for tax law. Hence, a final decision that an item of income must be reported in a particular year is not res judicata regarding whether the same item must be reported in a different year. So if the IRS says, hey, this year, or they miss it, next year could be they might treat it differently. So procedural aspect. Schluti. Schluti doctrine, which comes from a case, Schluti, is a when question. Accrual method taxpayers that receive prepaid amounts for services, right? Because accrual method, you record income as it's earned. If you get prepaid amounts for services, you must. general rule is you must include the income upon re the prepayment. There's a few exceptions to this, but that's the general rule. That's schluti. All right, 37 is Skelly Oil. Skelly Oil Doctrine is another one of these uh, when questions. A deduction for repayment of an amount not fully taxed in a prior year may be limited to the portion taxed. So that is a when question. It goes along with the Aerosmith Doctrine. It goes along with the Stanford and Brooks, with the U.S. v. Lewis, that whole line where it's like, oh, you know, every year is kind of a separate year. Well, this one is an exception to that where you have to look because in the previous year you might have got a deduction. Sham transaction 38. This is one of those ones along with the business purpose, substance over form, form over substance, economic substance, where, hey, economics, are you doing something solely to avoid tax? But, or do you have some type of economic involvement? So sham transaction, sham transactions are ignored for tax purposes. This is an extension of substance over form doctrine. It tends to apply to egregious uh, cases, including ones involving fraud. So maybe you marry somebody solely to get tax benefits, but not, for no other reasons other than that, right? To be able to use capital gains, capital losses. Substance over form doctrine. So we had the form over substance. Now we got substance over form. So substance over form, the substance, and this is another one of these um, ones. It's not five questions. It's part of that line, just like sham. The substance of a transaction controls over its form. So just because you form an entity and you're doing something, but you do it solely to avoid tax, you look at the economics, the economics of the transaction. And you're going to see this in partnership tax, substantial economic effect. Are you just allocating solely to avoid taxes? Or is there some economic reason why you're allocating as well? So substance over form, we, fo we focus on the substance. Last one, tax benefit rule. This is also known as the no double tax benefit principle. So this one can be considered for both income, 
groups and deductions. So tax benefit rule says an event fundamentally inconsistent with proper beneficial deduction in an earlier year sometime results in income. So for example, let's say you take, this is the most widely known example for what we're saying here. Let's say you itemize the year before and you get state taxes and you deduct your state taxes, state income taxes. And then the next year you get a state income tax refund. Guess what? Because you got the benefit of the state taxes, paying that and you get a refund of your taxes, you have to include it the next year because of the tax benefit principle. This tax benefit principle, no double tax benefit, can also be used for items of income, right? If you got a deduction for something in one year, you got to include, we saw that, also to stop you from deducting things in the future. All right, so that is the end of the top 40 doctrines.